Are you clear that you can take control of your intention and decide where you will place your intention? You can take control of our intention. I'm, do, I'm not sure that I would be able to do it on my own. I, I just followed your voice. Mm -hmm. And I have the feeling that it was because you told me what to do that I would. You shouldn't do what I tell you. Well, just for fun right now, without pick a place that you want to put your attention on your body as an example and do it. Yeah. Just do it. Yeah, I do. Can you do that? Yeah. Do you see that move there? Yeah. You can do it. I can do it. <laughs> no, but the intention <laughs> is only going to develop as you as you choose to practice it. Okay? Mm -hmm. From a creative interchange point of view, if you don't appreciate that what you just did has any value, of course you won't <coughs> practice anything. Okay? That's a given. Mm -hmm. You're still putting your attention where it always was. Right. And so you'll keep getting what you always got. Mm -hmm. and, and if you're happy with what you're always getting, you know, keep on. Keep on keeping on. Okay, here's the, the biggest, one of the biggest lessons. The first lesson is to realize you can do this on your own, but you've never been told that that's a very important skill, have you? Nobody ever told you that controlling your own awareness had any real use in the world. Educators. No. Parents <laughs> first, then educators. Um, but the issue now is your self-talk, because that's where you're running your programming. Your self-talk is telling you, this is a good situation. This is terrible. Oh, my God, I hope that doesn't happen. I can't believe it. All this stuff. What you're doing now is running on autopilot about what somebody else, by and large, mom, dad, teachers, preachers, you know, you name it, have taught you, and you're running on autopilot. And so that is dominating your current created self. Again, I'm not saying that's bad. I'm just saying if you want more opportunities, if you'd like to discover more about your own internal and external life, then you have to intend to put your attention there. Because the longer and the more you put your attention anywhere, that's the part that will begin to develop. For instance, cab drivers in Paris, if you autopsy their bodies after they're dead, which I suggest is the best time to autopsy anybody, <laughs> You'll find out that the, there are more cells and connections in the area of brain regarding location. In other words, that's all they do all day long, and so they're always thinking in terms of how do you get there, what's the fastest way to there, blah, 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 blah. And so all of their energy is going there, but it has physical implications. The brain will over time begin to mimic where you put it. And most people do not know that about themselves. If there's a major message out of all of this, it's that. How many of you think you're free? You see, most people confuse freedom with liberty. Liberty is your capacity to go and move about as you see fit and you don't have some of these police officers stopping you from going there. That's liberty. But nobody can touch your freedom but you. You may stop my liberty and let Ronnie takes me off to the, you know, to the jail and locks me up. He can control my body, but he cannot control my freedom. I can choose to be angry and mean and, you know, at him. Or I can choose to say this is not going to do anything to me. Freedom and liberty are not the same thing. But a lot of people, I think, have been conditioned to believe they are. Freedom can never be touched. It's inside you. Where you use it is when you decide with your intention to put your attention where you want it. And if you put it there enough time, it will begin to make actual physiological changes in the neural structure of your brain. It's your call. Up until now, you've probably left it 
to whoever the people were that conditioned you. I hope you used wisdom in choosing when you were a little kid who to listen to. Otherwise, you're at the mercy of Uncle Harry or something like that. <laughs> Now, I'm going to just skip through this part, but the main message of this section is, and you can practice it, even with what you've learned so far, is that if you decide, I'm going to practice where I put my awareness, and you've got some heavy chores in front of you, but you can do it. Nobody's stopping you except yourself. Now, if you get results from it, it doesn't mean your spouse her friends won't complain. I like you better the other way. You may say, well, now you have an opportunity to grow as well. <laughs> you can either enjoy the new me, or you can start down a road <laughs> of upsetting yourself on a daily basis, which I don't advise. But what will happen is you can look at other people differently. I can choose to really hear you and really listen to you, or I can do my usual thing. Uh huh, yeah, that's a good idea. Where I'm not even there, I'm still in my own head. Most people see other people how? As they are. I see you in terms of who I think you are, who I've assumed you are, who I'm used to seeing you as, and that's how I see you. The problem is that many times it doesn't match who they really are. And that's unfortunate because then we don't even see each other. So, what we are moving towards is a kind of ability to be an observer without making all the judgments. And I guess I'm asking you for a while, be a good scientist and observe yourself. What are you thinking at a given time? What emotions are you emoting at a given time? Try to look at it from the point of view of an observer. But the biggest part is there's a part of you when you're doing your self-talk that is watching and listening to your self-talk. Are you familiar with that? Who's listening to the voices in your head? I think everybody. Huh? Only, only you. Say what? Only you. Yeah, we're not talking, we're talking about that self-talk. Who's listening to the self-talk? When you say to yourself, if I don't catch this bus, oh man, that's going to be a real problem. Johan's going to jump into a little bit. Man, there's a part of you that can watch and listen to that conversation. That is your observer. If you would spend more time with your observer, you will have less time spent on being a victim of some of the crazy stuff that goes through your head. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Intellectually, it may make sense. You won't know the, the value of it until you do it consistently enough that you begin to catch yourself about to go down a road and you realize, I've been down that road. It never felt good. I always get upset. Why would you choose to go that way then? Well, before, you didn't have a choice. You were halfway down the road before you even realized you were down the road. Now you see it before you go. And you can make a decision, I'm not going there. It hasn't worked, it hasn't, so why should I? That's where the change can begin to occur, and it's your change, your choice. Not somebody trying to control and change you. you how many of you find yourself resisting when somebody tries to change you? <laughs> so why would you go around trying to change somebody else? <clears throat> but we do it all the time, don't we? <clears throat> all right. I want to look at the second phase of this so we can get to some other stuff later. And that is how you appreciate or don't appreciate something. <clears throat> you are the decision maker about where you're going to dwell on this one as well. But this is where perception is introduced. I begin to hear the voices or think about situations, but then I tag them with emotion. I like this. And so I quote, feel good. Can't believe that happened. I hate it. It's always happening. Why does it always happen to me? 
Who's generating all that? I don't experience it as me doing it, but it is me doing it. You cannot hurt me unless you actually get your fists closer than a micro uh, distance apart. As, as soon as you touch me, you have the capacity to hurt me. But as long as you never touch me, the decision is mine. And it's my decision how I will react to your hitting me in the nose. If you're bigger than me, I think the best decision is not to hit you back. <laughs> if you're smaller than me, I can play intimidator. But perception adds meaning. This is what it means. If I say so-and-so got up from her or his chair and walked across the room, that's an observation. The moment I say, I wonder what was going on. I guess he needed to go to the restroom. What am I doing? I didn't see him go to the restroom yet. So what am I doing? In advance, I'm anticipating what they're going to do next. So I have taken over. I'm not, actually I'm not actually observing that, but I am, in my perception, perceiving that. Because that's what I know you're going to do if you got up and you went toward that door. In my mind. So perceiving and observing are not... Where's he going? Let's check this out. <laughs> Let's see what he's up to. Let's all conjecture what we think he was doing. Okay? We've already talked earlier today about you have an intrinsic worth. Let me go back one second to the exercise. How many of you got really, really relaxed when we were doing that? Can I see your hand? Mm -hmm. You really felt relaxed. Did you feel kind of a peacefulness and a calm? Mm -hmm. This is important stuff. Did you? Yes. yes. Okay. That is your normal way of feeling. That feeling is always there. But the moment you get caught up in something that's caught your attention and is stress producing, you will override that feeling inside you. You'll no longer feel that peace and that calm. It isn't because it's gone. What would be the reason based on what we've been saying today? You shifted your attention. You gave an interpretation. And you're reacting to it now. And so do you feel peaceful? No. I'm bent out of shape. Well, guess what? If you could stop what was going on up here and return to that place, you would discover the peace is still there. All I have to do is stop all this other nonsense and I can quiet down. That's why meditators and people who practice their yoga regularly and other forms of contemplation will take maybe one or two deep breaths and suddenly they're back to what they call centered or some other word they may have for it. I don't care which word you use. It's not magic. It's simply that your body is in a peaceful state if you'll allow it to be and put your attention there. The moment your attention gets distracted, then you find yourself back upset. Your intrinsic worth was there when you were peaceful. That's your intrinsic worth. The moment you think you've got to be performing, now you put an edge on it. And until you complete your performance and feel like, oh, wow, I succeeded, I got through it, then you'll have positive emotions. The moment you walk out the door and realize you have really, if you talk about screwing something up, that's what I did today. Where are you going to be? What's your feeling going to be? Your attention will not be on the peacefulness inside. Your attention will be directed on your failure and the fact that I look like a butthead to everybody else in the world. And guess what? You're upset. And the issue is, is that working for you? You enjoying that? And if you are, fine, keep it. You can go on and emote and be anxious all day long. It's yours for the asking. Yours for the asking. But most people don't think they can do that. They really believe that being upset is, quote, appropriate. You're not being a human being if you don't get upset like me. Really? Which one's being a human being? 
Sounds to me like you're lost in another world where it's driving all your chemicals right through your, wherever it is you drive your chemicals. So I make the distinction between the creative and created self. I sometimes call it I awareness versus me consciousness identity. But I can observe me in terms of what me is doing and me has been out of shape at a given moment. I merely provide that information. In case you're interested, <laughs> you're flying off the handle here, blaming your wife for this and your cat for that and something else over here. It makes me aware of that and when it does, I am now in a position to shift my attention. I can keep running with this and secreting the emotions or I can start to let go of it. Now, if you let go of it, here's the experience you will feel. You will feel your emotions dissolve. Now, years ago, if you were a Freudian, you thought, oh, that's terrible. You're repressing or suppressing. That is not the same thing. If you're really looking at your emotion and you change the situation and realize the emotion is totally inappropriate or it's a waste of time, it dissolves. You, your, your adrenals quit working overtime and they quit. It may take you a minute or two to mellow out, but it's your choice. Or you can go to your doctor and get a pill to try to mimic the same chemistry. The problem you will face for that is there are no pills that do not have side effects. If you do it from the inside out, there will be no side effects. If you do it the other way around, have you, have you ever listened to, do you have to, in Europe, do they have to run through the litany of all the things that can go wrong if you take a drug? No. In the U.S. that's required now, and it's, lo it's almost longer than the whole advertising. <laughs> and, they, and they put pretty pictures and play soft music in the background so you won't be aware of the fact that taking this pill literally can cause a problem worse than anything for which you're taking it. You'd be better off with what you got is taking the damn pill because you're going to be in big trouble over time. They have another pill for that. That's not <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Are you, are you distressed over your pills? Well, what a deal we got for you. We'll give you another one. You know the number three killer in, the, in America in healthcare, the number three killer? You probably think it's something like cancer or heart attack or whatnot, right? The number three killer in the American healthcare Sugar. system Sugar. is the healthcare system. <laughs> it's true. Why? They used to call it iatrogenic medicine. It meant physician-induced illness. But one out of five that go into a hospital will come out with a problem they did not have before they went in. Okay. Our infant mortality rates are worse than yours. And we, and, we, and we pay more for it and can't, you know, are going broke on it. But the number three killer, misdiagnosis, uh, gave you the wrong medication, gave you the wrong uh, dosage for the, uh, for, the, for the medication. You can go down a whole list of things and you find out our doctors who take an oath that they will do no harm are the number three killers. I mean, that's scary. But we're paying dearly for it. We enjoy it. <laughs> Here's the main thing I want you to learn about appreciation. There's an old joke about, what was his name? Uh, who's our catcher for the Yankees? Uh, who was that? You ask us that. Huh? You ask us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Europeans are supposed to know this stuff. <laughs> Americans are dumb. Uh, Football players, yes. No, this is, well, in baseball, he, well, he's the guy that's noted for saying, it ain't over till it's over. Mm -hmm. Remember, have you heard that phrase? Yes. It ain't over till it's over and that sort of stuff. It ain't over well, till the Germans has won the game. <laughs> well, we, <laughs> but they have a, a joke about some empires that, that empire the game uh, in, uh, in baseball. But the, the final conclusion is, it isn't a ball or a strike until I say it is, is one of the ways you do it. In other words, is it a ball or a strike when they throw a fat, you know, throw the ball? And as the one umpire says, it ain't nothing until I call it. 
And that's true. Well, the same thing is true about good and bad in terms of negatives. You and I can look at the same thing, and I say it's great. You say it's stupid. Who's right? We both are. From our frame of reference, we're both right. Our problem is, though, if we have to reach an agreement as to whether it's useful or not. And that's when the communication breaks down. We're saying here, I need the ability to look inside your worldview and see how that is useful or why that is a threat and not just stand in my own world. You ever heard the word empathy? Empathy literally means I'm getting into your world to see how you evaluate what you're looking at rather than I stand in my world and make all my judgments based on my concept of what's good and bad. The issue is everything can be good, everything can be bad, or find things that can be used from it, and therefore a more appreciative way of doing things is not to assume, because I think it's good, that it's therefore perfect and good no matter what. The issue is no, there's another way to think about it, another way to look at it. Make your decision after you've looked at both sides not a knee-jerk emotional reaction. I like it, I don't like it. But most people listen on good, bad, right, wrong, like, dislike, agree, disagree. That's perception. Observing would simply say, it is what it is. I can go ahead then and attach a meaning to it and assign it a positive or a negative. But that's up to you. Okay? Now, of course, if the police are around, you may want to be sure that your decision is pretty close to the one they would make. <laughs> Otherwise, you may be in big trouble. Mm. By the way, Charlie, this is Yogi Berra. Yogi Berra, that's the guy. Thank you. I see. <laughs> I knew you guys knew. But there's a, that's also a song of Lenny Kravitz. And that's perhaps for us Flemish mm. people. It ain't over till it's over. Mm -hmm. We'll capture that as better. Yeah. And Yogi Berra. That's, that's like Yogi Bear. That's well, he knew the thing to us. <laughs> okay, so we've got the, the main thing here with appreciation is to recognize whatever I'm listening to can be positive or negative. It's a matter of making a decision. And if somebody just said something I don't like, I'm going to try to find out what, why they do like it in order to get inside their world and understand it makes sense if you look at it from their frame of reference. Now they need the benefit of my frame of reference. If you share the frames of reference, you're set up to go to the next phase, which is how you're thinking about stuff. Most people think either or. Either it's this or it's that. It's black or white, good or bad. What we have to begin to master is, no, it's yes and. Yes, it is this, and it's also that. And so it's learning to think that way. Who taught you to think either or? You didn't dream it up by yourself. You were taught by mommy, daddy, and math teachers. No, that's, that was for my grandson. He teaches math. But the issue is, you were taught what the or is, by somebody else who told you it's either this or it's that. You, so you begin to think that way. But you don't have to think just that way. It's a, it's a way of thinking, but it is not the final end all of end alls of ways of thinking. So that if the Americans and the Europeans or, or the Brits and whoever else it is are sitting down to the when you get it's either my way or the highway, conversation is already in trouble. How do I show that I have respect for your position? I find value in it. So what we're saying about creative interchange is I can be more accurate and honest and authentic about what I'm saying if I'm aware of where I'm coming from. I can be more appreciative of your position and mine. Once again, if I realize there's possibility for value in anything or anyone. 
And finally, I don't have to stick with this either or concept. We can go to what we call both and wishing, thinking, or building and developing. Okay, I like this and this and this about what you said. In fact, I can tell you that the research shows that if you don't like something, it'll take you four positives to get to the point where you can find something positive in what I said. You're so invested in what you think is wrong with it that it takes that much effort to shift your chemistry so you can find value in what I'm saying. Otherwise, you're not going to go there. You're still locked inside yourself. So what you do is practice finding the positives in anything, no matter what it is, so you can get good at that and realize I can intend to find the positives in something and I'm not just acting out of a knee-jerk reaction. This one says, I like this and this and this and this and what you were saying. And then comes the big and. And here's where I'm in trouble. I don't see, I, it looks to me like if we do what you're saying over here, something I value over here is going to get lost. That sets up the situation where we got these four things we like, and we're going to create or invent a way to get the best of this one and the best of this one. So that when the two worlds come together, we'll have six rather than we beat each other up and we end up with two, which is what people do. They, quote, compromise, and they end up with many times the worst case scenario. Part of, part of compromise problem is, and our U.S. Congress and Senate can't even get there anymore. So they can't even compromise. That was the great goal in the past. It was never the great goal, though, of creative interchange. Creative interchange says, I want your best and my best. The parts we disagree on, we'll create together an alternative. It isn't me versus you or you versus me. It's us finding a creative solution that's more than either one of us. That simple notion is quickly taught to children who can see it in a hurry. Adults can't because they're so conditioned it's either good or it's bad. It's right or it's wrong. Somebody taught you that. So both and wishing thinking is building and developing this into something beyond where we are. And finally, it's to understand both and what we call convergent thinking. We got diversity. You had a bunch of ideas, I had a bunch of ideas, so we got a lot of diversity. We don't agree on any of them. The only key is how do we begin to converge these so we're getting the best and the most of you and the best and most of me. That would make for a fairly good marriage. But very few who engage in that world ever find it. They learn to sort of tolerate each other. In, in the average marriage in the United States, if you step over here, he blows up. Step over here, she blows up. Try to step in the middle and they both blow up. And what it is, their marriage becomes a minefield. And they learn where each other's minds are and these manage to skirt the edges. They never do have a relationship built on both of them because they're too busy avoiding all the things and pitfalls that can go wrong. You ever run into that in Europe or is that just in America? Just in America. A little bit more in the States.